This is Brian Reisman, host of Side Jam, the proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Singer, composer, and activist Serge Tankian has always blurred the lines between the personal and political in his art, either with the multi-platinum Grammy Award-winning metal band System of a Down, or in his subsequent solo work and projects like the rock musical Prometheus Bound, which he created with Tony Award-winning lyricist and playwright Stephen Sater. A forthcoming documentary called Truth to Power chronicles Serge's life journey, which includes his mission to get Turkey to officially acknowledge and make amends for their Armenian genocide from over 100 years ago. Sometimes Serge does not need lyrics to express his emotions, as he has recorded an orchestral album, an acid jazz release, and composed several movie scores. His latest project is Fucktronic, the genre-bending soundtrack with dialogue to a non-existent movie inspired by the absurdity of British gangster films. He created the album with mindless self-indulgence frontman Jimmy Urin. With his music and activism linked, it made sense for Serge and I to talk about the latter in this episode of Side Jams. I called him at his home in New Zealand via Skype. We discussed his activism, politics and music, mentoring younger artists, and staying motivated as he grows older. As I was editing this podcast, major protests had already been sweeping the U.S. and beyond in the wake of the death of George Floyd. Serge posted anti-Trump sentiments on his Facebook page and had no problem pushing back against some balking fans who clearly had not scrutinized his lyrical messages after all of these years. Well, hi, Serge. Thanks for chatting for Side Jams. Nice to chat with you again. Thanks, Brian. How are you? I'm good. I see you're, you're relaxing there in New Zealand. It's a little more relaxed there than it is here. Yeah, it's definitely. <laughs> we've talked about music over the years, but we've also talked about activism, which is something I know you have the Truth to Power coming out. Yeah. It's about specifically your journey in music, uh, music activism. Yes, it is. It's uh, an activist journey through the world of music, which has basically have been my life for, for 25, 30 years with the system in there and really interesting archival footage and kind of really understanding where we all came from and, and the drive that the, the need to raise awareness about the Armenian genocide became kind of like a raison d'etre for us and, and how that worked its way into other forms of activism and injustice in terms of, you know, taking all that on. System performed in Armenia for the 100th anniversary of the genocide. Are we any closer to like broader international recognition of that? We are. U.S. Congress, both houses uh, recognized the genocide in last year in, uh, what was it, November or December? Right. So the um, United States officially recognized the genocide now as well. A lot of nations do. Um, but ultimately, it's about putting pressure on the government of Turkey to properly recognize its own history uh, and justly recognize it, its own history and, and make, make amends for it. Um, so all of these international recognitions are building to that point. Unfortunately, you have the leadership in Turkey with uh, President Erdogan, who is pretty much over the top insane, I would say. Yeah. Uh, he's he's a tyrant, doesn't care what anyone thinks. He does, you know, probably one of the largest uh, jail, number of jailed journalists around the world. You know, he's put hundreds of thousands of people on um, their work for being involved with the Gulen movement. He's, I mean, the stuff that he's done is just incredible. And then he invaded Syria, obviously. Which movement were you mentioning? Uh, the Gulen movement, one that that he was tied into okay. uh, years ago. And then he obviously, you know, it's just, he's he's a tyrant that's out there that, that the United States deals with, like many other tyrants that the United States deals with. And one of the things I've learned, if you want to talk about lockout and lessons learned, I don't know if you want to go there, Brian, but sure. one of the things I've learned is that the Machiavellian view of the end justifies the means in working with horrible dictators for the United States around the world so that we can secure shipping lanes, oil, many other resource consent type of things. They're no longer valid. You know, it's not going to work with the youth that's coming now. Yeah. And... The environmental devastation that we are going upon the planet that we now face, what you know, being home and seeing an 8% reduction in carbon uh, is an incredible thing. It doesn't mean that we need to stay home for the rest of our lives to do it. But what that does make us realize is that there are voluntary ways from diet to how we spend our time and, and, and what we do with, with our resources to changing the way, you know, the... My favorite quote is, the earth sent us to our room and told us to rethink this whole thing because we've fucked it up, you know? Um, <laughs> it's a good one, actually. Yeah. I'm hoping people are going to learn things, and I don't know if they will. It's been hard. I mean, quarantine, like, I'm a writer, so I can burrow. And I'm sure you know as a musician, you can spend in time indoors. I mean, when I wrote my Bon Jovi book, I was in two, pretty much two months indoors. Although now I'm starting to go, okay, it's been two months. Like, all right, I'm starting to feel it a bit. At yeah. the same time, yeah, it's tricky. And, you know, of course, we have all the keyboard warriors out there. But I guess for you, the key to activism has also been out there doing it. It's not just saying it. 
Right. When did you actually first start being an You felt that you were an activist or became aware of that? I never really thought about it, to be honest, but I, I was always, you know, uh, the um, kind of hypocrisy of the tabooist not using the G word, the genocide word in the U.S. by the U.S. government to appease Turkey, to sell them Apache helicopters or, or whatever trade became kind of like the wake up call for me to go, shit, if this is something that is, you know, uh, is being kind of hidden under the carpet because of other what's the word, um, nefarious reasons for other reasons, right? Yeah. Uh, how many other truths are there? How many other injustices out there that are being kind of hidden because it doesn't serve the profit margin or it doesn't serve this or that foreign policy geopolitical initiative? Yeah. So it kind of made me grow as an activist. This is before even becoming an, a musician or an artist. And I think, you know, it was in my teens, I guess, that I, you know, that the activist side of me developed, yeah. You're down in New Zealand, which is now, people are saying, has a kick-ass prime minister. She's getting pressed for being, and she's young, she's late 30s. Very different yeah. than the kind of model we have in, in, you know, up here. I wouldn't model, but yeah. yeah, yeah no. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about, what what attracted you to New Zealand? I re, you know, it's funny, I remember when we did the interview for Grammy years ago, we bumped into Anthony Kiedis at that sandwich place that you like, whatever, in Malibu. And he oh, was, yeah. And you guys are talking and he's like, so are you North Island or South Island? And I'm like, I'm so not a part of this conversation right now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so what attracted you to actually going there? What was it? Anthony actually had a place here years ago. I, I think he sold it a while back. But I came out here on the Big Day Out tour, which was a big tour that no longer exists, a huge Australia, New Zealand tour. That's right. And I felt, I intuitively felt a belonging here. I've never felt anywhere else. I, the country is physically absolutely beautiful. The, you know. There's very little pollution. It's it's clean, green. Uh, people are really very down to earth, well educated democracy. It's very transparent democracy. I, I gotta say, in other words, it's you know the types of corruption you see around the world, from post oligarchic or oil regimes to modern American corruption, like K Street lobbying firms and the Electoral College, or anything that stops the people from ultimately getting their vote, you know, yeah. gerrymandering. Like, there's so much corrupt, legalized shit in the U.S. politics that it's disgusting. There's none of that here. No corporation can spend money lobbying the government. It's, it's very simple. It's very down-to-earth. It's very reasonable, and it's very just. And I like that. That, that works with my ethics a lot. Is that, is that peaceful for you? So when you go out in the rest of the world and you have to deal with everything else, you're like, oh, I can come back and just chill. I truly feel... Much, very much at home here in New Zealand. Yeah, I like being in the States as well. My whole, you know, my parents, my all my friends and everyone I grew up with is in Los Angeles. And, and so I've got a huge history there. But but this is where I feel more at home than in L.A. I've never really loved that city. Really. Yeah, I remember I was chatting with Azam Ali also a little while ago. She's part of the Persian community there, obviously, yep. as well. Those, do those two intermingle sort of Armenian and Persian culturally? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're Armenia and Iran are neighbors. And so I think a lot of there are a lot of uh, Iranian Armenians and Armenian Iranians. And uh, and there is a definite uh, intermixing and, and understanding of each other's culture, although they're not the same culture, but they're all very old and beautiful cultures. And so, yeah, I mean, I get I get a lot of love from uh, Iranian f fans and, 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 and I have a bunch of Armenian Iranian friends, close friends uh, in the States. Uh, so. It is, it is very close in that sense, yeah. So now, obviously, you know, since you feel like you've, been, you've really been an activist your whole life, I mean, when you're young, you've got that fire, you're angry, you know, you want to change things. How do you temper that as you get older? Does it sort of anger at things remain, or does that get sort of channeled in a different way? It's an interesting question to ask, and I appreciate you asking it, because it makes me really kind of think. Uh, I think as you get older, a part of you just gets over shit, and instead of really fighting it and stuff, you just want to go fuck it all you know you know that kind of a thing there's an aspect of that that i think that any person who's been doing that for a while will get but there's there's an there's another intellectual level that instead of being only angry at something and and you know you you kind of think through it really well i think um i don't know i'm, I'm not sure what the what the correct answer to your question is but it's definitely different you know as you age and as an activist but the thing that remains the same as when you were a kid is that injustice turns you off it it, it makes your you know it just angers you it, it, it turns you off and you want to do something about it and whatever you do about it might be different than when you were a kid but 
it, you get that same kind of revulsion, repulsion, 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 repulsion. whatever. Right, both. <laughs> both to injustice. And, and that hasn't changed in an iota, you know? You had radio shows in the past, too. I think both you and Tom Morello, actually. Yeah, Axis of Justice. Has yeah. shows, have, have you done any of that recently? No, Tom's been doing his own uh, radio show on Sirius, I want to say, yeah, uh, for, for a number of years. But Access, we had God, we had for many, many years on the KPFK Pacifica network down in Southern California. I think we probably talked about this before, but I always feel like there's a lot of metal fans and hard rock fans. It's like I feel like on stage the people tend to skew more left, and then in the audience they tend to skew more right. And there's always been this schism. In a way, have you how have you sort of yeah. rectified that in your mind over the years? I don't. <laughs> I, you know, I, I've always, I guess I, you can explain it as I've always explained music like pizza. You know, some people like the crust, some people like the cheese, some people like the topping. You know, mm. the the uh, right. So <laughs> you know, so so when I get people on on my uh, socials that are like, oh, I love your music, but I don't want to hear your political ideas and stuff. And, that's fair enough. I mean, if they're nice enough, it's fair enough. But sometimes they're really mean. But what I don't understand, and, and a lot of a lot of other people that follow the music say the same thing. They're like, "Have you not listened to the fucking words in twenty years?" Like, I know. He, he's been saying, you know, it's like he's been saying that he's been saying all this stuff through his music all this time. It means that you're just like, what are you just dancing to it because it's groovy? Like, I mean, you're not really getting the message, and that's and that's okay too. Obviously, there, you know. People just like hard music. They want to listen to hard music. They've never even thought that BYOB is anti-fucking imperialist. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know how you can't, but I guess maybe, you know? So it's, it's, very, it's very interesting to me seeing that the only thing I can say about that is that we need to spend more on public education. I think one of the few <laughs> <Yeah>. things, <laughs> one of the few things that could be a, a great solution to our long-term environmental possible self-destruction and all of that the easiest way to start fixing it is first fixing us we have to fix us first have you talked to younger musicians who might come to you and want you to mentor them, or just give either mentor them or give them an idea of how to navigate what we're going through and how to make their activism effective there have been yeah a, a number but you know it's it's hard because you have to between uh, work for awareness and nonprofit and activism creating your own you know works whether it be music, art, films, family, and then trying to, I do, I do some of that. I've, I've worked with this organization, nonprofit organization called Creative Armenia, um, and I've done a bunch of stuff with them, mentoring and mm -hmm. trying to help different types of artists, you know. And I've done that with smaller bands in the past, uh, spending quite a bit of time producing them and trying to get them signed through my label years and years ago. But I got burned out from it because it just became very... Um, it's one thing as an artist, if I'm collaborating on something, mm -hmm. I can be involved and help produce. Mm -hmm. It's another thing when I'm not actually an artist on it, it's, it's difficult for me because I am an artist, you know? So seeing people make the wrong choices, decisions, f fucking their lives up and stuff like that and being, trying to help them while all that's happening has been really tough. It's just, it just kind of made me, for years ago, I said, I'm never going to produce another artist again and, and, and. But when I find someone that I really like, like recently I've been uh, working with this guy, Brendan. He's my friend, Bear McCreary's brother. And oh. he is a phenomenal singer. And he's got, he's got this incredible band. So I've been kind of reposting his stuff. And he'll hit me up and we'll get on a call. We get together for a coffee when I'm in L.A. And try to, try to help him because I think he's uber talented. I think he's a phenomenal songwriter and singer. And I want him to break. I want people to see it, you know. So... I do what I can when I can, I guess. Yeah. Now you're a family man. You have one child. Yeah, one so far. What is that like, and how has that changed you now in, pers in terms of being, in terms of you personally, and in terms of your activism? Like, how does that? What different perspective do you get? Well, first of all, I, I always thought I was a very patient and peaceful man until I had a child. <laughs> 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 and now I'm like, I'm not very patient nor peaceful, apparently. Um, no, I, I. It challenges different things. It's. It is a joy. Okay, first of all, I got to say that. When you have a kid as an artist, you know, as an artist, you create all these pieces that you're identified with music, records, whatever, scores, symphony, you know, yeah. and that's how those are your creations. Those are your creative babies. Right. If you will. But once you have a real kid, in my case, I don't know how it is for everyone else. I was ready to toss it all into the sea. Like I was just like, as long as he's healthy and smiling and happy, I'm ready to give up what's the most valuable to me. 
which wow. is my music, my art. And so that's that should be said. But then there's challenges. With each age, there's challenges, you know, of being a parent. Every Every parent knows this. And it really, really makes you look at yourself and go, fuck, am I doing the best I can? Am I, you know... You learn more about that being as they grow up, but you learn also about yourself in, in the process more so than you ever thought you could without them. I've never been a parent, so it's like I have all these friends to do it. And sometimes I'm like, am I an adult? Because like I have friends who are married with kids and have a house. Like, yeah, I got an apartment. I got a car. But I guess for yeah. me, it's different. I don't. One of the things you do have to sacrifice is a little bit of freedom. You have to be more present. You can't just be traveling everywhere and doing all these different things. And some people are suited to it for it. And it feels like you've been in more New Zealand recently than L.A., since January. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, I still travel, but not as much as before. And I, I don't really want to as far as, you know, travel and touring and all that. It's, it's you know, I think once having a kid and, and being more settled in scoring and, and that kind of life, it's, you know, I'll still do a tour here and there for fun. But it's not something that that really turns me on as much as before. Yeah, yeah. So as far as your activism, was there any been some moment that was really special to you, something you worked really hard about that you wanted to change or some cause that you had and something that really, not really I, don't know, I don't want to say paid off because that just sounds like there's sort of, you know, this sort of selfish goal, but was there something that really was... Well, if there's, if there's anything that's paid off and it's been recent, it was the recognition of the genocide by U.S. Congress, which we as Armenian Americans have been striving for for decades, you know, pretty much all of my life. And so that was a big, big thing. After that, I came here in New Zealand and I went down to Wellington to New Zealand Parliament for an event that I spoke at, um, encouraging the New Zealand government to properly recognize history because they haven't. Australia hasn't. Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, Britain and the U.S. were kind of on the same page looking at each other as to how, because their relationship with Turkey is similar, although some sell more weapons and some don't and whatnot. But, yeah. you know. Um, they kind of go off each other's cue on, on this stuff. And once the U.S. did, I'm like, okay, it's time to focus on Australia and New Zealand now, especially since I'm a resident here and I live here part of the year. So I did that, which was very, very cool. It was actually in the press and on TV and all that. And then COVID hit, like, the days after. I was like, oh, fuck. You know? There's always something. There's always some injustice. In fact, there's so much I can't even catch up with it because of, I mean, social media, you, you find out about all these things on a daily basis all these organizations raising funds for these food banks, those food banks, this country, that country, this organization, that's organization, kids, environment. And I try to be as helpful as I can. To, but then there's also, you know, you also get kind of whittled down your energy. You can only do so much as one human being. So you kind of go, OK, I know these people. I know they're doing a good thing. I've checked them out in person. I'm going to support them. I'm going to do this or do even donate to them and all of that and then donate to these people. But, you know, it's like there's only so much you can do. Right. But what, what I'm really, my, my, my focus now is where do we go next as society? Yeah. I mean, what's next for us? Because this pause, this involuntary pause, which has horrible detrimental effects on a large part of the population, not just those who have contracted and died from the disease, but the number of unemployed, the number of people that are losing their homes. And, you know, it is, it is horrible. It's horrific. But it's almost natural. Like this was done, this wasn't a human construct. They haven't been able to prove that. They're trying, I think, yeah. in the laboratory in Wuhan or all that. This is, this is something we have to look at the fact that all of these diseases came from animals and the ingestion of animals, yeah. whether it's uh, COVID, whether it's uh, the bovine thing or the SARS or like there's so many things linked to the consumption of animals. I'm not trying to be PETA here or anything like that. But what yeah. I'm trying to say is that the largest carbon emissions on this planet are done because of land use for animal farming because of the amount of meat consumed on the planet i heard a statistic i don't know if you saw the film game changer recently i saw yeah. uh the human uh the michael moore thing that he, what was it called the human animal the human animal i think, I think. So, yeah anyway it, it, it's quite interesting as to what's next i mean we have to dial down our lifestyle, basically. We have to change the way that we live for us to coexist on the planet. And to do so, that's why since the 1980s, since Reagan's time, we've been cutting funding for education, public education in the U.S. We went from a very top 10 type of educated country to the 30s and 40s, and I don't know where we are now. And it's fucking embarrassing. That's not right. 
That's why we get stupid leaders. When we're stupid, we deserve stupid leaders, you know? And it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way, you know? Um, we should be looking out for our, each other and the whole planet. We should be smart. We have probably some of the smartest, incredible people in living in the U.S. You know, you've got these tech entrepreneurs, billionaires, like all these incredible talent. And yet this, this yeah. kind of scourge of fucking middle-aged type of thinking in some ways. So... <laughs> We got to get over this. We got to we got to move forward. We got to move forward and we got to be smart and we got to be we got to reduce our lifestyle. We got to if every person one of the statistics from those movies from that first movie Game Changer I think was if every American eats meat only once a week or twice a week, I forget what it was, versus every day, it'll make a lasting carbon reduction that's that's incredible more so than you driving a Prius versus, you know, driving an SUV. That the difference is so minute for that in terms of carbon emissions compared to you eating less meat on a daily basis. Like, it's huge difference. So to be able to use the land that's limited on the planet, obviously, to grow food or let it go back into wild, you know, to, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the way to do it. And a lot of people are waking up to this, that even alternative energy cannot save us because even if it replaced all of the fossil fuel energies, which it doesn't. It's still yeah. just a minor percentage. But even if it replaced the whole, it's not enough for us to move forward. We're still looking at extinction. It's not about the planet. We're extincting our own, extinct, you know. Well, that's what I always say. It's like the, the planet's not going to blow up. It'll be here. No. We'll be gone. We're going to wait till we self-disease and fuck off, basically. So if we want to survive, we have to control our lifestyle. We have to control our consumption more than anything else, our, our food consumption. And, and then the rest can also fall into place as far as more sustainable. And, and we also have to change our metrics, our benchmarks for progress as civilization can no longer be unsustainable economic growth. Yeah. We've got to look to something else. Lifestyle growth, happiness index, anything is better than this. In an ecosystem that's limited like planet Earth, you can't continually expand. It doesn't work. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm a meat eater, but a lifelong meat eater. But I'm like, you know, vegetarianism is starting to look better and better every day. Like, you know, finally, I was thinking, you know, you've done all different things. You're a musician, you're an author, you've done poetry, radio host, all this activist, everything. Is there something else that you're excited to do? Some sort of new adventure that you want to go on? Yeah, I want to write a book. I've been wanting to do it for a while and looking for the right opportunity to slow down. I thought this pause was going to be that, but it, it wasn't. I produced a lot of music instead, which is great. But I've always uh, earmarked writing a book about the intersection of justice and spirituality as the theme. Oh, that's interesting. It won't be a system of a down biopic. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I figure it's going to be like whatever you're like, fucking justice, man. I want a system biopic, right? You'll get those online on the social media. But yeah, I like, do you read uh, Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah, I've actually interviewed him a couple of times. Cool. Yeah. Great author. But I love the way that he has small stories and they all have like some underlying common denominator, you know, to the whole kind of theme of the book. Yeah. I want to do something like that. Small, different stories that deal with the intersection of justice and spirituality. And his last one was really good, too. Yeah, he does find a way to connect all those things. And it, it takes a while to put that together. That's the thing. I was like, people probably assume that guys like you're a machine. Yeah, I'm just going to crank all this stuff out. And you get older, man. It's not that easy. You're, you got to like, I guess it's the challenge of finding new ways to say the same things. Also yeah. being open to new ideas and exploring those and trying to deal with those. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, man. You're welcome. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Sounds good, brother. Take care.